this week on Warriors and Company. The rule of law isn't really the rule of law if it doesn't apply equally to everybody. I mean, if you're going to put somebody in jail for having a, a joint in his pocket, you can't let high-ranking HSBC officials off for laundering $800 million for the, the worst drug dealers in the entire world. And there is not a country in the world that believes that the U.S. drone attacks that we are doing on countries that we are not at war with is the right and sustainable solution for us. All we have is the president interpreting his own powers and the limits on his own powers, and that is not the way it's supposed to work. We need more oversight. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, independent production fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation. Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation the HKH Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman, and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. This week, two United States senators insisted that the Justice Department come clean. Why are Wall Street's big banks not only too big to fail, but too big to jail. Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, a Democrat, and Chuck Grassley of Iowa, a Republican, are outraged that the giant banks violate the law with impunity, laundering money, cheating homeowners, falsifying information, every trick in the ledger book. They sent a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder demanding to know why the banks get away with fines instead of jail time. Maybe they had their anger royal by frontline, public television's premier investigative series. The other night, Frontline broadcast a report called The Untouchables on how the Department of Justice allegedly has looked the other way for fear that prosecuting the banks would do even more damage to the American economy. There was a definite sense that justice backed off. Did the government fail? A number of people told us that you didn't make this a top priority. Well, I'm sorry if they think that because I made it an incredibly top priority. That's Lanny Brewer, the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division at the Justice Department. A week after the Frontline report, he stepped down and is now expected to return to private corporate practice, one more government appointee spinning through the lucrative revolving door between Washington and Wall Street. That door could be a big reason why government treats the banks with kid gloves. A man who once worked for Citigroup, Jack Lew, the President's Chief of Staff, has been picked to be the new Treasury Secretary. And Mary Jo White, the newly named head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, is a chief litigator at a top law firm representing big investment banks like Morgan Stanley. With all this happening, it's time to talk with journalist Matt Taibbi. You've seen him on our broadcast before. A contributing editor at Rolling Stone, he's been tracking the high crimes and misdemeanors of Wall Street and Washington for years. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. You're working on a story right now to come out in a couple of weeks on the HSBC settlement. That's right. the, tell me about that, why it interests you. Well, the HSBC settlement was, was uh, a really shocking kind of new low in the history of, of the too big to fail issue. HSBC was a serial offender uh, on the money laundering score. They had been um, uh, twice given formal cease and desist orders by the government one dating back as far as 2003, another one in 2010, uh, for inadequately policing uh, the, the accounts in their system. Uh, they uh, laundered over $800 million for, for cartels in Colombia. Drug in cartels. Drug cartels in, in Colombia and Mexico. Uh, they laundered money for uh, terrorist-connected banks. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, Russian gangsters, literally, you know, I talked to one prosecutor, it's like they broke basically every law in the book and they did business with every kind of criminal you can possibly imagine and they got a complete and total walk. I mean, they had to pay a fine 
$1.9 billion, a lot of money. It's a lot of money, but it's, it's five weeks of revenue for the bank <laughs> to put that in perspective. And no individual had to suffer any consequences at all. There were no, uh, no criminal charges, uh, no individual fines, which was incredible, incredible. Lanny Brewer also forced the Swiss bank UBS, as you know, to pay a big fine in the LIBOR, the price-fixing conspiracy, and, and that outraged you as well, didn't it? This is, this is the, uh, I think, the biggest uh, financial scandal of all time. It was a price-fixing scandal where essentially some of the world's biggest banks got together and they conspired uh, illegally to, to uh, artificially rig the uh, uh, global interest rates. Uh, which are based upon this, this London interbank offered rate, which is a rate that measures how much it costs for banks to lend money to each other. Uh, this LIBOR rate affects the prices of hundreds of trillions of dollars of, of financial products. And it goes from everything from credit cards to mortgages to municipal bonds. Basically everything in the world, the price is, uh, you know, is somehow connected to LIBOR. And these guys were monkeying around with this for individual profit. And they got, again, a complete and total walk on this. They, there, was no, there were no criminal charges, which is just unbelievable. Did you see the Frontline documentary, The Untouchables? I did. Then you're familiar with Lanny Burrow's testimony. You made a reference to losing sleep at night, worrying about what a lawsuit might um, result in uh, at a large financial right. institution. Is that really the job of a prosecutor to worry uh, about anything other than simply pursuing justice? Well, I think I am pursuing justice, and I think the, the entire responsibility of the department is to pursue justice. But in any given case, I think I and prosecutors around the country being responsible should speak to regulators, should speak to experts. Because if I bring a case against Institution A, and as a result of bringing that case, there's some huge economic effect. If it creates a ripple effect so that suddenly counterparties and other financial institutions or other companies that had nothing to do with this are affected badly, it's a factor we need to know and understand. Think about what he's saying. He's essentially saying that some individuals are so systemically important that they can't be arrested and put in jail. Now, it's only a few steps forward to the corollary to that, which is if some people are too systemically important to arrest, other people may safely be arrested. So we're creating a class of people who are arrestable and another class of people who are not arrestable, which is crazy. It's a crazy thing for the assistant attorney general to say, to admit out loud that he's dividing Americans up into these two classes. There's no reason they couldn't have taken a number of individuals from some of these companies and put them on trial. Uh, historically, uh, we've always done this, even under the Bush administration, if you go back just 10 years, um, you know, WorldCom, Enron, you know, Adelphia, we took the, the leading individuals at these companies and we put them on trial to, 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 to make an example out of them. Uh, and this is exactly what we're not doing in this case. Uh, those companies were systemically important then. Uh, I don't see why uh, they can't do the same thing now. You were shocked when you heard that President Obama had named Mary Jo White to uh, lead the Securities and Exchange Commission. You wrote that she was a partner in a law firm that represented a lot of these big banks. Uh, you know, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Chase, AIG, Morgan Stanley. Uh, you said she dropped out and made the move a lot of regulators make, leaving government to make bucket loads of money working for the people she used to police. And I gather your great concern is that you don't want to see the country's top financial cop being indebted to the people who created the, 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 the bankroll. Right. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's just simple common sense. I mean, if you're sitting on 10 million, 15 million dollars, however much money she made working there at Deborah Waz and Plimpton when she was a partner, uh, and you owe that money to this specific group of, of clients, um, and now you're in charge of policing them just psychologically. Think about it. It doesn't really work. You know, it doesn't really work in terms of how aggressive a prosecutor should be, how, what his attitude towards, um, you know, the people he's supposed to be policing uh, should be. It's just, it, the, the circumstances just aren't quite right. You'd much rather see a career civil servant in that, in that situation. She was once a tough pros prosecutor. What's your beef? Well, you know, I, I have people who are telling me that I'm wrong about this, that Mary Jo White was an excellent prosecutor and she's, she's a good choice. But, um, you know, I also, I, I've done uh, stories in the past about uh, an episode. You had a, a, an SEC investigator named Gary Aguirre who was pursuing an insider trading case against the future CEO of Morgan Stanley. 
Um, he asked for permission to, to interview uh, that future CEO. His name was John Mack. Uh, it was denied, and it was because there was communication between Morgan Stanley's lawyer, who at the time was Mary Jo White, uh, and the higher-ups at the SEC, uh, who included the Director of Enforcement, Linda Thompson. Um, Aguirre was later fired uh, for complaining about having this investigation squelched. Blowing uh, the whistle. For, for blowing the whistle, uh, but the SEC was later forced to pay a $750,000 wrongful termination suit to, to Aguirre uh, in that case. But what's so interesting is that Aguirre's boss, the guy who, who killed that case, went to work for Mary Jo White's firm nine months after the case died, uh, and he got you know, a multi-million dollar position. It's a classic example of how the revolving door works in Washington. You, know, you have these regulators at the SEC, and they know that there's that job out there waiting for them. So how hard are they really going to uh, regulate these companies when they know they can get that money? Um, but in Washington, you know, people kind of shake their heads at it because it's so common uh, you know, that these, these people, they, they move from government back to you know, these high-priced uh, legal defense firms uh, that represent the banks, and then they go back to government again. And it's just sort of this coterie of, of you know, 100, 200 lawyers who really run this entire yeah. thing, and it's all the same people on, on both sides. Lanny Brewer was one of them. He was in a very prestigious uh, Washington law firm. Jack Lew, the incoming Secretary of the Treasury, if he gets approved, served three years at Citi mm -hmm. uh, Group. His record there, according to the Wall Street Journal, was not very... Uh, uh, lustrous for a man who's about to take over the Treasury Department, but the Wall Street Journal uh, suggests that he got his job not because he had the experience, but because he was a crony of Robert Rubin. Jack Lew was back. He he served in the Clinton administration. I think he worked in the OMB in the you know Office of Management of the Budget, um, and he uh, was in, he was one of the key players in helping pass the repeal of Glass Steagall, um, and. You know, this is kind of the way it works. It's not a one-to-one, -one, you know, obvious connection. But you know, Glass-Steagall was repealed specifically to legalize the merger of Citigroup. Uh, and you know, coincidentally, Bob Rubin, who was the tre Treasury Secretary, and Jack Lew end up working at Citigroup. If you, you know, five, ten years later, and they make enormous amounts of money, and then they go back to government. And again, this is just sort of this merry-go-round that everybody in Washington knows about, and that's the way it works. How do you explain? President Obama's attitude in this. When he was running for president, he promised to close the revolving door, and he seemed genuinely shocked at the collapse of the financial system and the bank's role in it. But he also was raking in massive campaign contributions from these uh, very people. Did those investments, did those contributions turn out to be good investments, or do you think he's just overwhelmed by the system that's controlled by these guys? I I think that they genuinely uh, accept the explanation that they're probably hearing from all these people who, who run these Wall Street companies. Um, you know, people like Bob Rubin and, and Larry Summers, who are close confidants of the Obama administration, um, are probably telling them, look, if we start prosecuting all kinds of people for, for you know, X, Y, and Z, there's going to be major instability in the markets. People are going to flee uh, America. They're going to withdraw capital from the American financial system. It'll be a disaster. Jobs will be lost. But it's just not an acceptable uh, explanation. I think they're, Why? You know, well, just because the rule of law isn't really the rule of law if it doesn't apply equally to everybody. I mean, if you're going to put somebody in jail for having a, a joint in his pocket, you can't let high-ranking HSBC officials off for laundering $800 million for the, the worst drug dealers in the entire world, people who are suspected not only of dealing drugs, but of thousands of murders. I mean, this is a, an incredible uh, dichotomy. And eventually, you know, it eats away at the very fabric of society when, when some people go to jail and some people don't go to jail. But do you ever have the sense that those guys are, are you know, are, and their lawyers are up there laughing at, at all of us uh, on their way to the bank? No, no pun intended. I mean, the fact of the matter is they are immune. This, the, what they, the, there was a story in the Washington Post the other day by Howard Schneider and Daniel Douglas with the lead. Five years after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, a global push to tighten financial regulation around the world has slowed in the face of a tepid recovery, which the banks helped bring on, and a tough industry lobbying effort. Big banks, insurers, and other financial giants remain intact and arguably too big to fail. I mean, nothing really has changed. No, no, definitely not. And, the, and if, in fact, if you want to look at it uh, objectively, since 2008, 
um, you know, the companies that we're talking about have become bigger and more dangerous and, and more, more immune to prosecution than they were back then. And you might even say by a lot. I mean, uh, you know, the first factor was that you had a series of mergers in 2008, which, you know, made companies like Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan Chase, um, you know, double in size or they were, they were much bigger than they were before. Uh, so therefore, they're more dangerous. Um, and so you have these companies like Barclays, like Royal Bank of Scotland, like UBS, like HSBC, which are, you know, we, they can't be regulated. We, we can't get an accurate accounting of what's going on in their books. Um, and apparently now we can't even criminally prosecute them for laundering money like HSBC does. I mean, uh, we just keep setting the bar lower and lower and lower, and it's, it's, it's getting scary, I think. There's a new analysis out just the other day from the Economic Policy Institute that shows the super rich have done well in the economic recovery while almost everyone else has done badly. And the economist Robert Rice says, we're back to the widening inequality we had before the big crash. Are the financial and political worlds just too intertwined and powerful for anything to change? I mean, it's, it's a concern. I, I would worry about it, but it doesn't mean you can't you know, try to stop the problem. I, I definitely think, though, that there is this connection now between political power and financial power that's just becoming more and more overt. I mean, what, what uh, Lanny Brewer is saying in that video is uh, these people who have an enormous amount of power, destructive financial power, uh, we can't prosecute them. Uh, on the flip side, what, what, they're, what they're essentially saying is that people who don't have any money at all, um, it's politically safe uh, uh, to put them in jail. Um, and so, you know, we're creating this, this kind of dual class, and it's, uh, it's, it's a very upsetting and disturbing situation. Matt Tybee, we'll be looking forward to your next expose in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me on. If you've seen or only heard about the film Zero Dark Thirty, you know it's triggered a new debate about our government's use of torture after 9-11. Right now, all this is about simply is you coming to terms with your situation. It's you and me, bro. I want you to understand that I know you. That I've been studying and following you for a very long time. Some people leave the theater claiming the film endorses and even glorifies the use of torture to obtain information that finally led to the killing of Osama bin Laden. Not true, say the filmmakers. But others argue the world is better off without bin Laden in it, no matter how we had to get him. What's more, they say, there hasn't been a major terrorist attack on American soil since 9-11. If we have to use an otherwise immoral practice to defend ourselves against such atrocities, we're okay with it. Or so the argument goes. But torture is only part of the debate over the fight against terrorism. What about the undermining of civil liberties here at home? The rights of suspects? The secret surveillance of American citizens? The swollen executive powers first claimed by George W. Bush and now by Barack Obama. Soon after he succeeded Bush, President Obama announced he would not permit torture and would close down the detention camp at Guantanamo Bay. He also said this. Our actions in defense of liberty will be just as our costs, and that we, the people, will uphold our fundamental values as vigilantly as we protect our security. Once again, America's moral example must be the bedrock and the beacon of our global leadership. Four years later, Guantanamo not only remains open, but a few days ago, the State Department announced it was eliminating the office assigned to close the prison and move its detainees. Meanwhile, President Obama has stepped up the use of unmanned drones against suspected terrorists abroad. Those drone attacks have killed a growing number of civilians and have prompted the United Nations to launch an investigation into their legality and the deadly toll on innocent people. The central objective of the uh, investigation I'm formally launching this morning is to look at the evidence 
that drone strikes and other forms of remote targeted killing have caused disproportionate civilian casualties in some instances, and to make recommendations concerning the duty of states to conduct thorough, independent and impartial investigations. A key player in our government's current drone program is this man, John Brennan, a senior official at the CIA and head of the National Counterterrorism Center during the Bush presidency. Reportedly, Barack Obama considered offering him the top job at the CIA in 2008, but public opposition caused Brennan to withdraw from consideration. Obama kept Brennan on as an advisor, and last year, when Brennan became the first official to formally acknowledge that the drone program even existed, he again encountered protests. How many people are you willing to sacrifice? Why are you lying to the American people and not saying how many innocents have been killed? I Thank you, ma'am, for expressing your views. There will be time for questions and answers after the presentation. In, in uh, uh, Pakistan, who is killed because he wanted to document the drone strikes. Now, despite Brennan's past notoriety, Obama officially has nominated him to head the CIA. This time there's been little criticism of the decision, so we'll watch for Brennan's upcoming confirmation hearings to see if any congressional critics press him on whether the Obama administration is fighting the war of terror within the rule of law. Which brings me to my guest for this discussion. Vincent Warren is executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, which is dedicated to advancing and protecting the rights guaranteed by the United States Constitution and the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Vicki Duvall served on the staff of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence in the White House Counsel's Office for President Clinton and as a legal advisor to the CIA's Counterterrorist Center. She practices law in Washington and recently published this op-ed in the New York Times provocatively entitled, who says you can kill Americans, Mr. President? Welcome to you both. Thank you. As I said in our opening, the torture debate is back because of the movie Zero Dark Thirty. You've seen it. Where do you come down on whether the film glorifies, condones, or misrepresents the use of torture? I think it's for the viewer to decide whether it glorifies it. I, I did not find it glorifying in any way, shape, or form. Um, I, one could argue that the film is so disturbing that it will, in fact, aid in the, in the movement uh, to, to not enable the United States to engage in those practices in the future. From your own experience at the CIA, did any of it ring true? Well, I left the CIA in January of 2000 and was at the, on the committee for 2001. When I worked in the Counter-Terror Center, and we worked, I worked directly on the hunt for Osama bin Laden, uh, the programs that would capture and or kill him, pre-9-11, and um, harsh interrogation, um, detention, uh, and certainly killing were not on the table. You would have been laughed out of a conference room if you brought up any tactics such as those at that time. I think that the film condones torture and misrepresents uh, the facts about what torture actually does. Uh, it condones torture in the sense that uh, the arc of the film really shows that that methodology, which really happens in the first part of the film, as according to the film, leads to uh, the killing of Osama bin Laden at the end. You know, the idea is that uh, for an, an narrative that people are supposed to cheer when the bad guy gets it, but nobody is really uh, figuring out how to feel about the bad guys in the beginning, because torture is a tremendous problem. It's, a, it's one of the big three things that countries cannot do. One of them is uh, slavery, another one is genocide, and the third one is torture. The human rights law sees these as the crimes that human beings should never commit to each other. So one of the questions really is, is does torture work the right, the right question? Uh, that's what the, bill, the, the film seems to say, and that's really not the moral question. The question is, should we be doing it at all? But let me ask you, uh, Vicki, do you know if the torture that was introduced after 9-11 produced usable intelligence? Well, no. During the period of time after 9-11 that I was general counsel of the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, I personally uh, was not privy to uh, those programs. To the extent that they were going on at that time and to the extent that they were briefed to Congress, they were briefed to a tiny gang of four or gang of eight uh, group within the Congress. So staffers didn't know about it. There was no oversight of it. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I do know, though, that Senator Feinstein has finally 
gotten, she's the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, has finally gotten a report out uh, of the committee uh, through the Republicans and Senate vote. Uh, allegedly, it's 6,000 pages long, and it covers all things uh, torture. And she's very upset about the film, and she believes that whatever you want to say about uh, torture and, and its human rights violations, that it did not produce the intelligence that the film suggests that it did. And she says the use of these harsh interrogation techniques was, quote, far more systematic and widespread than we thought. But how do we ever know if that report isn't published? Um, you know, this is one of the problems with oversight of uh, national security matters. Uh, some of these things have to remain secret. Uh, you can debate over which ones should and which ones shouldn't. But someone has to decide that this information can be released without harming national security. And I don't see that happening anytime in the near future. It is possible that some of the findings could get out, though, in a declassified version. Clearly, the Senate Intelligence Committee wants to and needs to keep some of this stuff classified, but we run into this problem where if you look historically, um, the only way that a country, and a, certainly a country like the United States, can torture is if they do it in secret. Right? There is a connection between the secrecy and the torture. It's not a mistake um, that George Bush created secret black sites, some of uh, which uh, feel, appear in the film. It's not a mistake uh, that even the names of the people who the government was torturing, torturing became classified information. The Center for Constitutional Rights is an organization that has represented right. many of many torture victims, knows that very well. So what we're, le what we're left with here in the age of President Obama, who really sees himself as the transparency president, is this question about how transparent will or should a government be in order for the rest of us, the fourth branch of government, the people, to make sure that this type of torture and these types of crimes don't happen in our name. The European Court of Human Rights found last month that CIA agents tortured an innocent German citizen named Khalid El Masri, who was arrested in Macedonia and then handed over to a CIA rendition team, taken to Afghanistan where he was severely beaten, sodomized, uh, dealt severe pain and suffering. It's the first time the European court has described CIA treatment of its terror suspects. Do you know about that? Well, the El Masri case is a very interesting one, um, and not just because of the factual circumstances that you laid out, but also because of the legal journey. Um, Khaled El Masri also had cases here in the United States, and the U.S. courts actually refused to look into the merits of those claims, looking at things like the state secrets privilege or different types of immunities that would keep him as a torture mm -hmm. victim from being vindicated in U.S. courts. So, in fact, um, what I think is the lesson here is not so much um, um, that the European court could make those findings. It's that the European court did make those findings. You mean he couldn't have gotten a fair trial? Or the courts wouldn't at least give him a trial in this country? In this country, very few of the post-9-11 torture victims have ever had their gay in court. And in fact, until recently, um, the Center for Constitutional Rights has been successful in a settlement. We, we got $5.2 million from U.S. corporations who uh, were involved in harsh interrogation and torture in Abu Ghraib for 72 torture victims. But none of those cases have gone through through adjudications. No court has made a finding the way that the European court did about the circumstances of their torture and their abuse. That's a problem here in the United States. And when you couple that with an aggressive uh, policy from both the Bush and the Obama administrations, where the Obama administration is now making the arguments that courts should not hear these, these types of cases, that's when you really run into problems. It's, it's a great point, and it, it feeds into all of the issues we've been talking about involving presidential power to conduct these kinds of programs, whether it be a, detention, a secret detention program, a black site, a harsh interrogation. They prefer not to call it torture in the Bush administration because torture is just a word, and it has a definition that they don't agree with. In the Bush administration? Yes. The Bush administration, well, the Obama administration doesn't torture, and he said that. And he said that soon after he came to Yes, he did. And do you fact, believe him? I do. And in fact, uh, he was instrumental in, he, in arguing for and then as president releasing the legal justifications uh, that the Bush administration had relied on uh, to conduct the program and opened them to the light of day. And they were reviewed and harshly criticized. In fact, some of the authors were were even considered for censure. The fact of the matter is the two branches of government uh, set up to keep a watchful eye on the president in these areas have a lot of trouble doing it for a variety of reasons. The courts have trouble taking these cases. There are so many constitutional and 
common law and statutory uh, limitations on their ability to hear, even hear these questions, never mind resolve them, that we're not, we don't know what the constitutional outcome is because the courts aren't ruling on it. I'm not convinced uh, that the U.S. doesn't torture at this moment just because uh, President Obama said that we don't. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm not convinced is because there is so much information that still is remaining classified, uh, that there's so much work that the Obama administration could have done, particularly in the last term, around pursuing accountability for the Bush administration uh, that they're not doing. So the courts, the problems in the courts are not just a question of court inability to do something, that there's a structure in place that actually, I think, was, it's been protecting the U.S. government from these types of inquiries, and they're being utilized now. But we're in a situation moving forward where the, where the people really need the ability to hold our governments accountable moving forward for these type of violations. Do you think the president, President Obama, is fighting the war on terror within the rule of law? I do not. In fact, I know that he is not. What about you? I am concerned that he may not be, but I'm not going to go quite so far as to say that he is not following the rule of law. I think his lawyers have told him he is, and he believes them. Let's look. Example number one is the U.S. drone program. And that the drone program uh, is something that has been uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administration say are authorized by the uh, authorization of use for military force that was passed by Congress. And the way that the Obama administration is using that is that they're dropping bombs targeting for killing uh, terrorist suspects in countries at which, in which we are not at war, including Yemen, including Pakistan, including places in Africa. There is no legal authority uh, for these types of drone attacks. The U.S. cannot drop bombs on people in places that they cannot send troops. Um, it is a, a mechanism, I think, a, my, in my view, a political mechanism that says it is so much easier to talk about how the wars are over and we're bringing troops home um, and that we're not putting more troops in harm's way by dropping bombs. Uh, there's no legal authority for that. There no, there's no judicial oversight for how they determine who they're going to kill and who they don't want to kill. There is a... Uh, Right after 9-11, there was, uh, on, the, on this kill list, there were approximately nine people, um, al-Qaeda operatives that uh, the military, the CIA, said that they wanted to get. Now, this is something that is going to expand, and there's no legal authority, and there's no judicial oversight. And I would say that here, where we have, it, by latest reports, 3,000, both uh, people who are classified as militants and people who are classified as civilians that have been uh, killed by drones since these program started to happen, that is way, way, way too many. And in fact, uh, on the day of the inauguration, three people were killed outside of Sana'a and Yemen by drones. This is a real problem. Well, I take a little bit of a different approach to this than, than Vince does in the sense that um, the use of drone attacks throughout the world uh, against foreign persons, I think, is troubling from a moral, ethical, and policy point of view. But I don't subscribe to the fact that it's illegal. Um, under U.S. law, uh, and that's the law that the president is bound by the Constitution to follow. My focus has been primarily, and I'm not saying it's a good program, I'm just saying that I think it's a moral policy question rather than a legal one primarily for the president. Um, I focus primarily on the targeted killing of American citizens, which does bring into play the United States Constitution and the rule of law in the United States, and I'm very troubled about that aspect of it. Can you help us understand how this official program of targeted killing works? Apparently the agencies, primarily the, the Pentagon and the uh, CIA, nominate people to be on the list and it goes through a uh, what the White House promises is a very rigorous process of review to determine if those people should or should not be on the list. We don't know exactly what the standard is, but it involves a number of criteria including whether the host country, the country in which this person, this particular person is, is cooperative or not vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis capturing the person. In any event, they have a standard. Names are nominated. It goes through an interagency process. And finally, it makes it to the president. And he makes the final decision who is or is not on the list. Does that sound 
like what you understand? I think that's that's certainly what the what the government has said happens. And of course, this is the problem: is that the only thing that we ever know about the counterintelligence stuff over the last ten or eleven years has been either what the government has been forced to say, what journalists have been able to find out, or what human rights organizations like ours have been able to find out on the ground. But that's certainly what they're saying. Or what the government chooses to chooses what to tell us. What the government chooses to tell us, and very often what the government chooses to tell us is forced by uh, media work or litigation work from human rights organizations. There are U.S. citizens who've been put on the same hit list, the same targeted killing list, high value target list that foreigners have. And so far that we know of, three of them have been killed. Um, one of them, uh, I don't know if all of them were targeted. I know one of them was because it was, that information was released. That was Al Awaki. Al -Awaki. Al -Awaki. Anwar Al Awaki, uh, he's a United States citizen born in New Mexico. Uh, I'm not saying he's not probably wasn't a very bad man, but that's hardly the point. We have lots of very bad people who perhaps uh, we would like to put behind bars or even execute, depending on your point of view on those things. But plenty, of, plenty of evidence that he was a suspect. I think that's right, but there's plenty of evidence that lots of people are suspected of doing lots of things, and that doesn't mean we shoot them from the sky. I, I, agree. I agree with Vicki on that. And on the Awalaki case, the Center for Constitutional Rights and the ACLU, we both have a legal challenge. Uh, we've actually had two. The first one was in 2010 mm -hmm. to seek to prevent uh, the killing of Awalaki when it was made plain that he was put on the list. And the second case, after Awalaki was killed, he was also killed with another U.S. citizen, and then two weeks later, his 16-year-old son, about 400 kilometers away from where uh, his father was killed, was having uh, dinner in an outdoor uh, cafe with his cousin. And he and I believe seven other people were killed because they were looking to target somebody else. Who, by drone. By drones. Um, and that person that they were looking to target uh, reportedly uh, was, not, was not among the dead. And isn't the center, your center, representing that boy's Grandfather? We're representing the families of the people who were killed, which includes um, Abdul Rahman Awalaki, that's the grandson. We're representing his, uh, his grandfather, who's bringing these, these cases and these claims. On what constitutional grounds are you resting your case? He is a U.S. citizen. He was a U.S. citizen. He was born in Colorado. He went to Yemen with his family in 2002. As a U.S. citizen, we all have a right not to be summarily killed by our government without a trial. That's the, that's the, that's the legal justice. Maybe without a trial, without some without, process. Without due process, excuse me, without, without, without some process, whatever process is due to us, Correct. but certainly not in an extrajudicial killing by a drone. Under international law, there is no legal justification for targeting people without any meaningful oversight or articulable reason. There are rules that, uh, that have been established in, in terms of the law of war and otherwise that keep governments from just dropping bombs randomly on other folks in different countries at which it is not at war. And then the second piece is the piece that Vicky brings up, which is the constitutional issue that we certainly cannot and should not live in a country where the U.S. is targeting its own citizens for for killing without any due process at all. So we've moved from the Bush administration where we started out with detention in Guantanamo without charge or trial and now we're in the era of killing without char charge, or, charge or trial. Someone said to me on the day of the inauguration, you know, how can you fight a war against terror any other way than meeting the assassins on their ground who are willing to kill or be killed. And trying to make a point that, that it was very difficult for a president to know where to stop given the nature of the enemy. But war is difficult under all circumstances. And they're the ones, the presidents, Bush and Obama, who want to call it war because it enhances their own powers in, by doing so. The war powers. War powers. It. But the fact of the matter is for centuries we've studied the just war ethics and we've looked at the fact that sometimes our enemy doesn't fight fairly. That does not give us the right to do the same. Just because the enemy is ugly and vicious and does awful things does not allow you to do the same. It's, it's a basic tenet of just war ethics. Oh, I, I completely agree with, with Vicki on this. And I, you know, I, it's troubling to me that in this great country where we can send people to the moon, we can have these great debates about gay marriage, and we can really be invested in our own progress as human beings as, as a, and as a nation. It's troubling that the only 
way that we can seem to resolve, the, the way that the public seems to want to resolve the current terrorism problem is by turning our nation into a country that out terrorists, terrorizes the terrorists. That is precisely the wrong thing to do, and I agree with Vicky. It is not easy. It has never been easy. And what we should not be looking for is are easy solutions that are going to test well in the public. Those aren't the smart solutions. But we haven't experienced a major terrorist attack since 9-11. Doesn't that fact suggest to a lot of people that the war on terror fought on the terms you two are skeptical about is working? It suggests that. Um, there's no question about it. Um, you can't disprove a negative. Um, but I would also point out that um, right now we've killed as many people, almost as many people in the, in the last 10 years with drones as Al-Qaeda killed here in New York on 9-11. And I'm not looking to try to create some sort of proportionality. That's not my point. My point here is, is that there is, a, there is a, a methodology by which we can actually become our own worst nightmare and that the, the work that we're doing to keep ourselves safe in the short term actually makes us less safe in the long term. And we are very much on that axis. There is not a country in the world that believes that the U.S. drone attacks that we are doing on countries that we are not at war with is the right and sustainable solution for us. There, it just the pop, Popular opinion around the world is very clear on that. And in this country, we seem to have a problem with it. There are many commentators who believe, and some in government, who are concerned that the reaction in these villages, in these tribal areas, to the drone threat, which is constant over their heads, is uh, radicalizing some who might not have otherwise been radicalized. So I think there's certainly a concern that we're making the problem bigger. In your op-ed piece the other day in the New York Times, you called on the president to tell us where in the Constitution, in effect, he finds the authority to secretly target and kill American citizens. The people he suspects are involved in terrorist activities. What are you asking him for? What's the issue here? Well, the issue in that particular op-ed is focused primarily on the fact that there are legal memoranda in the Department of Justice that explain in great detail the legal support that Obama believes he has for, for conducting this program. And he won't re the Justice Department won't release them and he won't order them to be released, even though he himself released the same type of memo about President Bush's program. You know, tell us what your legal theory is. Congress isn't doing anything. The courts are having trouble doing anything. You're the only one who knows what your legal theory is. Tell us what it is so that we can decide if we, we think you're right or not. Uh, there are two issues in terms of whether Obama can be doing this. One is, does he have the power to do it? And that's what Vince has been talking about in terms of the authorization for use of military force and the laws of war and that kind of thing. The other is, is there some constitutional protections of the individual that stops him from doing it? due process, right to counsel, any of those kinds of protections that we as citizens have against our government, they have determined in the White House that those don't stop President Obama from engaging in these activities. I don't know if they're right or not. The Supreme Court has never been asked that question. One of the main problems here is, is that, you know, when we talk about um, the, the legal justifications and legal memos and things like that, we are now in an era where even the government's interpretation of the law becomes something akin to a state secret, that we have to go through legal hurdles to get the government to articulate the legal theory by mm -hmm. which they have the justification for doing things. That's a problem in a democracy. That is probably one of the deepest problems in a democracy. Remember, the, there are no court cases out there to look at. The lawyers for President Obama are speculating about what the law is. The executive branch is supposed to implement and enforce the law. The judicial branch is supposed to tell us what the Constitution says. We have been unable to get the judicial branch through, though you're trying mightily, to make that happen. So all we have is the president interpreting his own powers and the limits on his own powers, and that is not the way it's supposed to work. We need more oversight. You said Congress has a hard time pressing the administration on this. Why? Well, not to be too cynical, um, but we have a Democratic Senate, and we have a Democratic president, and we have a Republican House. So on issues of aggressive national security, um, a Democratic Senate who might, if President Bush were still in office, be jumping up and down and taking action of all sorts, effective or ineffective, that depends on your view, um, is not doing that now. They are not. They don't want to criticize a sitting president that is of their own party. They didn't doing, do it during the first term for a variety of reasons, including he had another election coming up. I don't know if they're going to do it this term either, even though he does not. 
Um, uh, Senator Wyden seems to be agitating in that direction, and we'll see what comes of that. Democrat of, of, of Oregon, he's actually been pressing for greater transparency he and oversight, indeed. but not getting anywhere, even Correct. among among his Democratic colleagues. That's right, and he's been he's on the Senate Intelligence Committee. He was on the committee when I was there. He's been on the committee for a very long time. And he is willing to press a Democratic president on these issues, but he hasn't gotten any traction yet. Senator Leahy, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, has, in my opinion, very feebly uh, pushed, uh, also without result. So would both of you agree with one of President Obama's counterterrorism advisors in his 2008 campaign, a man named Michael Boyle, who said that the Obama has been, quote, just as ruthless and indifferent to the rule of law as President Bush. He goes on to say President Obama has waged his war on terror in the shadows using drone strikes, special operations, and sophisticated surveillance to fight a brutal covert war against al-Qaeda and other Islamist networks. Essentially, he's saying there's no difference between the Bush administration and the Obama administration, and you're shaking your head. I do not agree with that at all. Um, the Bush, the very premise uh, underlying the Bush administration's uh, actions in all of these areas was that the rule of law does not apply to him. That if Congress uh, enacts a law and says, don't do that, that he can do it anyway. That's the unitary executive theory that was the basis for all of his activities. President Obama does not subscribe to that theory. If Congress passed a law tomorrow that said, you may not target with drones, I believe he would obey that but Congress isn't doing it. So who do we look to? I look to Congress. But who's going to push Congress to do it if the Democrats are so, skeptical about taking on the White House and they want to cooperate with the White House and the Republicans are, are on the other the side? The media, the American people, <laughs> the voters. It's, it's not a perfect system. And I agree with Vicki that there really is a fourth branch of government here that is probably the most important one. And they've and, been too quiet. But President Obama was reelected with a the public knowing that he was using drones in the war on terror. Um, there is a consensus that since there has not been a major terrorist strike on the United States since 9-11, something must be working out there. And his popularity is actually up over what it was even a few months ago. Where is your constituency for <laughs> these constitutional arguments? This has been the, the George Bush mantra. You can tell that I'm doing great stuff because nothing bad has happened. And when something bad does happen, whether it's big or small or minor, they grab more power. They don't give back more power, they grab more power. It's, this is a cycle in which the, the lack of terrorist activity is a justification for the methodologies, and any terrorist act activity that does happen is a justification for grabbing more power. So you have a situation now moving beyond the Obama administration. What, what would it look like for us if every country, there are roughly 50 countries that I believe have drone technology, what if they were allowed to uh, take their terrorist suspect wherever they happen to be and just to drop bombs on them? What would that look like? You know, that's, that's really where we're going. That's what's at stake here for us. It's really not a question about whether people like President Obama or whether he doesn't, whether they don't. And I frankly think um, that President Obama has done great disservice to what his ideals were and why we elected him in the first place in 2008, which was around the questions of transparency and human rights. And that's the piece that we actually need to keep our eye on in the next four years. You mentioned Senator Ron Wyden a moment ago. He is on the Senate Select Committee. He's allowed to know the legal rationale that's being offered for targeted killing, as well as all the countries where the killing is, in, where it's happening. But even he can't get answers. And he's promised to bring these issues up at John Brennan's confirmation hearings for CIA director coming pretty soon. What questions would you put to John Brennan when he goes before the Congress to testify on behalf of his nomination for a director of the CIA? I'm not going to quibble with them on the fact that they are really, really, really careful before they put someone on the list. I'm sure they are. And I would not doubt that the pers people they put on are threats to us. I'd like to move to the other point and say, okay, what about the process? Why can't the process include another branch of government? Why do you think that you should own this issue? Now, the Bush administration would say because it's war and we own war. I don't think the Obama administration would be, be quite that broad in their statements. I would like to ask Mr. Brennan, have you considered putting forth with, con with Congress the idea of perhaps legislating in this area? 
having a regularized system that involves other branches of government. We don't want to just trust one branch with this awesome power. I would love for uh, John Brennan to answer the following question. The legal justification for us um, to drop bombs in places that, like Yemen and places like Pakistan and North Africa, places at which we are not declared to be at war, is the following. I would also like to know what he thinks the line is between assassinating, targeted, killing uh, extra outside of the United States and within the United States. Is there actually a line that can be drawn? What if there is a foreign person within the United States? Does the authority that is invested in, in the Obama administration is claiming, does that allow them to, to kill people within the United States who are foreign? Does it allow them to kill people within the United States who are U.S. citizens? There is no meaningful line that has been articulated. Anwar al-Awlaki's cell phone had more protections than his life. What do you mean? Um, if we had wanted to target his cell phone, because he's a U.S. citizen in a foreign place. The Obama administration had to go to a judge in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and get an order authorizing the eavesdropping on his cell phone. If they want to kill him, they don't have to. So his cell phone's more valuable, has more protections because of Congress's actions. Congress gave that review to the court, and the president has to go through it. To kill him, they don't have to. This is the kind of thing we're talking about. That's right. The public narrative, I think, really is uh, the government must, we pr trust President Obama, the government must know what he's doing. So when these people die, there was probably a good reason for it, and you actually don't have to tell us what it is we trust you. That's where democracies die. That's where we go wrong. You should never, ever trust that the government is um, being completely and totally honest about the mistakes that it's making. And the stakes are so high for both the, for the law for our foreign policy and for civilians in a killing program that it should, we should be doubly uh, concerned in getting that information out there so that we make sure that we don't make those mistakes or we correct them when we do. Let's close with a brief discussion on, on, on the issue of surveillance and eavesdropping. On the 31st of December, the president extended this controversial uh, wiretapping act until 2017, the FISA Act. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Right. Are you both troubled by the seeming lack of oversight for this extension of surveillance and wiretapping of suspected terrorists in this country? Do you think there's a real danger here? I think there's a tremendous danger. And I think, you know, there has been a codification of the expansion of power under George Bush. And so any time that, that um, Congress or through policies that are happening now that we're institutionalizing, codifying, um, um, making hard into our infrastructure things that were literally unthinkable um, 10 or 11 years ago is of tremendous concern to us. It shows our slippage, and we don't always realize that that's what's happening because we can say, well, that's what the law says. And, you know, where I come from, and I think where we come from in the Center for Constitutional Rights, is that we find that there is virtually always a gap between what is legal and what is just and what is right, and that the problem that we have in this next four years is narrowing the gap between what the law says and what the law should be in order for us mm -hmm. to be um, safe, secure, free citizens within this country and to treat other countries and other people around the world with the same amount of respect. It's narrowing the gap between what's legal and what's just is what the big battle is. What's your greatest concern about this next four years in terms of the issues we've been talking about? We need Congress to step up and do its job, which is to conduct oversight of this president and all presidents, the presidency, not just President Obama, in order to get some of these issues. In fact, it's a golden opportunity to do it while you have a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president. It's harder if you have a Republican president because it looks partisan. Here, the, the two sides could work together. In fairness to President Obama, presidents don't like to acknowledge the giving up of power. No president does. On their watch, they don't want to be the guy that shrunk the job. But um, I do think that the Senate, uh, in particular, because it's still in Democratic hands, has a golden opportunity to get some of these things back under control so that when the next president comes in, we'll have some, some laws and some standards that we can follow. I very firmly believe uh, I, that President Obama, that he's our best chance 
that I can see for the foreseeable future to do exactly what Vicky said would be to shrink that pie of presidential power. He's inherited more from George Bush, and George Bush took more than anybody else. Um, if he doesn't do that, the next president will have more power than the previous two, and that we'll be back on the show in four years talking about how we've slipped even more and that there's more egregious policies, and we will be looking at the ramifications for these policies. I want to see that change, and it's going to take people here in this country to be able to make that happen. Ms. Warren, Vicki Dibble, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. That's it for this week. At our website, BillMoyers.com, there's a Q&A on the morality of the drone program with a political scientist who studies the ethics of war. There's also data on the number of people killed by American drones since 2002 when the attacks began. That's all at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. This episode of Moyers & Company is available on DVD for $19.95. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, independent production fund with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America. Designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.